Good uh, afternoon, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome all the journals that come to us uh, to the Multimedia Press Center of Rio Novosti. I also welcome our uh, guest, uh, the Executive Secretary of the Preparatory Commission for the Organization of the um, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, Dr. Lassen Zerba. In the course of our press conference today, uh, he'll uh, explain um, about the uh, activity of the organization, which efforts are aimed of putting uh, at uh, putting into force of the uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and about the measures uh, to track um, nuclear tests. Not to lose our times, a time I pass the microphone to our guest, Mr. Zerba. Добрый день. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity that you uh, you're giving us uh, as uh, members of uh, the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today. I'm in uh, Moscow to try and uh, uh, re-emphasize the excellent cooperation that uh, the government of uh, Russia and our organization uh, are having uh, through the strong commitment of Russia and uh, especially uh, uh, the government to what the CTBT and how important the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is to the international peace and security. Uh, we've been uh, building the political and technical framework for this organization to prepare for its entry into force. We've been uh, efficient in uh, showing how effective the international monitoring system could be in uh, making sure that no test, no nuclear test explosion goes undetected. We've built a, deter a deterrent uh, for the past uh, 16 years uh, that is put in uh, the service of our member states for them to uh, verify the compliance uh, to this treaty. We have uh, gathered uh, now a universal support. We have 183 countries that have uh, signed the treaty, 161 that have ratified the treaty. Uh, this is over 90% uh, of the world that is saying no to nuclear testing, no to any kind of explosion that could lead in the development of weapon of mass destruction, over 90% of the world that are for the international peace and security. We have now an Annex 2 framework, which is uh, a group of 44 countries which ratification is necessary for the entry into force of the treaty. We have said uh, six of those countries that have uh, ratified the treaty. We're expecting eight. Russia has been uh, key in uh, the P5 countries in ratifying the CTBT. Uh, Russia, together with France and UK, are among the P5 country, the nuclear power country, uh, to have ratified and signed the treaty. And uh, we're expecting the United States and China to follow suit to create that necessary momentum that will lead us into the entry into force of the treaty. In Vienna, we are a group of uh, experts, uh, diplomats and scientists that are working uh, day in and day out uh, to making sure uh, the political framework and the technical framework are in place. And then we 90% completed in terms of the technical framework. We are moving towards the necessary political setting that will lead us to the entry into force of the treaty. To that effect, we've taken the initiative to set up a group of eminent persons, eminent persons that are composed of uh, 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 the foreign minister of uh, Russia, Igor Ivanov, uh, whom the government has uh, kindly agreed to be part of this group. We're expecting this group to use their credibility, their credential, their experience, and then the contact that they've created in the past with the eight remaining countries to see how they can help us move forward. And this is what we expect from this group. And then we're confident that they'll be able to bring that second energy to the Article 14 framework, which is the conference that we have biannually to try and help promote the CTBT and its entry into force. So now, where do we stand with regard to Russia? Russia is an important actor of this treaty. Russia is supporting this treaty, rather is committing to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And Russia, as part of their commitment, not only the political commitment, but in, as part of the technical commitment, Russia has, is the second largest country to host uh, facilities of the international monitoring system. 
We're nearly 75% complete with regard to Russian completion of the International Monitoring System Station. We're working with the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to complete those stations. We're well underway. We're hoping that uh, the months and years to come will see the completion of the monitoring station in Russia. But to tell you how important those stations are, not only that they are important to the CTBT with regard to our prime mandate, which is the, uh, the development, I mean, the, the coverage of the global world with regard to detection capability, but for civil and scientific application as well. You've known uh, the event in uh, Chelyabinsk, uh, the meteorite in Chelyabinsk was well detected by our network, the infrasound technology uh, that has been uh, shown to the international community how effective the infrasound network could be to civil and scientific event that uh, of uh, this nature as a meteorite. But not only meteorites, but we assist as well the international community with tsunami. We yet to sign an agreement with Russia uh, in terms of tsunami, with your National Academy of Science uh, to give them the necessary framework for uh, the international framework for them to deal with uh, tsunami warning issue in Russia and around Russia. And this is our contribution to show the relevance to uh, Russia in terms of uh, by-product, if I can use this word, of our uh, monitoring system. This by-product in terms of civil and scientific application is important as well to the developing world. And that's why we have to keep our relevance, because if you take countries, small countries like Niger, Burkina Faso, or Costa Rica, I mean, the, the prime, their priority is not nuclear test monitoring. Uh, although they participate in the world peace and security, one, is, one of their priority would be probably what we have a, as civil and scientific application. Climate change, I mentioned the meteorite issues, uh, environment issue, our contribution, for instance, to the accident in Fukushima, and then so forth. So this is roughly what we cover at the CTBT and its international monitoring system. And we're trying to develop another component that is uh, very dear to Russia, which is the on-site inspection. It's an inspection framework that completes the verification regime of the CTBT, and Russia is uh, uh, well underway with this issue and, and very supportive. Uh, the fact is that uh, the director of this uh, division in the organization is uh, of Russian nationality, is Oleg Roshkov, and then is uh, helping us with his experience and diplomatic experience to see how we can move forward with this component of the treaty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, Zerba. Now I would like to suggest uh, that we open a Q&A session and uh, invite journalists to raise hands and ask questions. We are very limited in time, so that's why I invite uh, journalists to be active. Um, questions, if you please. Yes, uh, the second row, please introduce yourself. It's a task, uh, Gincharov Nikolai, Mr. Uh, Dr. Zerba. My question is as follows. The uh, CTBT uh, envisages uh, ban of all kinds of uh, tests, but nuclear tests can be used also in, uh, for civic uh, purposes, for instance, to uh, build um, underground uh, storages and some other underground works and uh, nuclear um, explosions are the only uh, possibilities to generate a nuclear power energy. It is a proven fact, uh, laser um, uh, compression or of diarrhea or some other uh, means uh, do not uh, bring um, as to the same result, but uh, it is uh, scientifically proven that uh, nuclear uh, bursts uh, generate um, nuclear power energy. Don't you think that uh, CBT, uh, CTBT may be on the way of uh, generation of, uh, nu uh, of nuclear power energy um, industry, uh, or something should be modified or changed in this area? The I think the question was, uh, you're talking about the nuclear blast and uh, nuclear energy and the role of nuclear test explosion and with regard to generating energy. So if I take in the context, I was a little bit uh, confused by the question and where to draw the line between uh, what you're talking about blast. 
Uh, first of all, when there is a blast, whether it's a nuclear blast or a chemical blast or any kind of explosion, our system is able to detect. Okay? What we do is to detect an explosion of any kind and then make the information available to our member states. The link to nuclear energy is a little bit of a fuzzy uh, situation that I didn't grasp, but what I can say is that in terms of our work of monitoring and verifying the treaty, when we talk about nuclear energy, we're getting into the framework of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So the CTBT comes as a complement in terms of informing our member state with regard to what the IEA does upstream and what we do downstream. This is what I can say with regard to testing and then what we do effectively, unless I missed the point in the question. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, I invite you to ask questions. While they're uh, getting ready to ask their questions, in your course of your visit to the Russian Federation, uh, you have a number of visits planned. I know that you are right from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Maybe you may um, just uh, discover some, um, just uh, reveal something of what you uh, discussed in the Ross Adam um, Ministry of the Nuclear Power Energy and in uh, the Ministry of Defense. I'm uh, uh, just coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where I uh, had a, a discussion with uh, Minister Lavrov and uh, Deputy Minister Ryabkov. I think it was uh, mainly about the status of the, the treaty and my vision for the future as a, new, a newly appointed elected executive secretary and uh, talk about the support of Russia. I think one of the issues that we discussed today was how a Russia uh, can uh, take into account the success of the international community in Syria and see how that could help the implementation of the CTBT in terms of ratification and entry into force. Uh, this is the substance of my discussion with uh, uh, Minister Lavrov. And then I think this is the message that uh, was well taken because we could use the success that the international community has achieved in Syria uh, to find the necessary framework to create flexibility, understanding, and trust uh, within the Middle East, whereby uh, uh, if Syria joined the CTBT by its signature and ratification, I think it would help ease the tension in this region and then put us underway, well underway with regard to further ratification and possibly uh, the overall framework and the overall dream, which is uh, a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. The other discussion was uh, mainly about the role of Russia and then where we have, uh, 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 where we are with regard to the build-up of the international monitoring facilities within Russia, and uh, they've uh, uh, assured me of the commitment of the government of Russia, and the commitment of Russia to the CTBT as a whole, to this treaty, to what they believe, and then to international peace and security. I think that was uh, uh, the substance of the discussion today and we will follow up with the Ministry of Defense to see how we stand <coughs> with regard to the build-up of the station, what are the hiccups, and how Russia could be helpful in assisting us in uh, finalizing the international monitoring system facilities within its territory. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zerba. Now I would like to turn to our uh, journalists once again. Do you have questions? Please pass the microphone to the last show. Aurora Skada, uh, Spanish Information um, Agency. You just mentioned the Russian uh, role of the Russian Federation in the regulation of the uh, Syrian uh, conflict. Uh, 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 what uh, may be uh, the role of the Russian Federation in uh, the case with uh, Northern Korea? Uh, he asked the question now, uh, will, uh, will this issue or, or the role of the Russian Federation in the uh, northern, uh, relationship with the Northern Korea be discussed at the ministerial level during your meetings? Uh, 
Yes, I've mentioned the role of uh, Russia in the Syrian conflict. Uh, when I talk about uh, the positive impact that it could have in the implementation framework of the, the CTBT, it's indeed how uh, the international community managed uh, to find the right setting in terms of giving to the United Nations and then to the organization of uh, uh, the OPCW uh, the necessary setting for them to play the effective role with regard to uh, finding out uh, what has happened in, in, uh, in, um, in Syria and then how peacefully this could be resolved. Indeed, that has some link uh, with the DPRK because in North Korea, North Korea is the only country that has tested so far in the past decade. As you know, the CTBT has been uh, a de facto moratorium whereby no one apart from North Korea has tested since the establishment of the monitoring system and the verification system. It's true we had uh, two tests in 98, but since 2000, it's the only test that we have. And then we're counting on Russia's support as well to see how we can engage in discussion with North Korea. And that was indeed discussed. Uh, the DPRK uh, in the six-party talk has been uh, approached. There are discussions underway. Uh, our hope is that that will lay uh, the framework for us to find how the CTBT could be put into context with the authorities in North Korea for them to join and then not be so isolated as they are or as they've been so far. Um, Mr. Zerba, I've got another question to you. How your organization and you in particular um, are going to persuade North Korea, who has um, who is command of uh, nuclear uh, technology, is not quite going to uh, to join uh, uh, CTBT. There are eight countries like that. Uh, what uh, your country is doing in this direction? We, our work is to not. Uh, isolate any country with regard to the implementation and the entry into force of the CTBT. We open to discussion with the eight remaining countries. We've engaged discussion with those who are open or who are on the way uh, to accept the framework of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, those who have signed. Those who have not signed, we engaging with them at technical level. But with North Korea, I must admit that there have been no contact whatsoever with them. But we're hoping that with countries like Russia and those who have the necessary contact with North Korea, they could help us bridge that gap and then find the necessary framework for us to engage in discussion with them. But what are we going to do with the eight remaining? I think I've mentioned the initiation of the group of eminent person and the participation of uh, former foreign minister Igor Ivanov. We're hoping that this group of eminent person of former prime minister, former foreign minister, former defense minister will be the right setting based on their experience, their credential, their contact, their political experience and their wisdom as well with regard to issues related to those countries, they would help us get well underway in establishing the necessary contact at high level for us to be able to enter in discussion and then create uh, the setting for their possible signature and or ratification and then get us closer and closer to what we're dreaming for, which is the entry into force of this treaty. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, follow up with this. Uh, my previous question, six uh, countries, um, for instance, um, and China and the United States are in particular, are not a party uh, to this uh, treaty yet. How do you work with these countries? How, uh, how they should be persuaded to join um, the treaty? Uh, because, uh, uh, example, uh, Example is very important for North Korea and for all other members of the six party uh, negotiations. Yes, indeed, uh, China and the United States, uh, when we say they are not party to this treaty, it's probably 
pushing a little bit because they've both signed the treaty. It's their ratification that is remaining. Uh, having said this, when I talk about China and the US having signed the treaty, we've been working for so many years with both countries at expert level uh, to establish the International Monitoring System Station in their territory. We've engaged in discussion with uh, the respective Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense. Uh, with the United States, we're participating in this educational process that will help them to deal with their domestic and national issues. Uh, what we have to do is to prepare that political and technical framework for them to find ground to convince uh, people nationally to ratify this treaty. Uh, for China, it's the same. Uh, what I could mention is that uh, the government of China has agreed uh, to sign uh, the testing and evaluation framework that allow China to sending data to the International Data Center in Vienna. And that's an important milestone because we've built station in China for the past 10 years and uh, connecting the international monitoring system facilities in China to the International Data Center in Vienna is an important milestone that will help the detection capability of the system and certainly help the coverage globally and then put us in a situation where uh, we ease uh, the perceived tension in some of the region with regard to the global coverage and then putting us away with some flexibility that could lead to more signature and ratification. The, the journals from the third row, Itar uh, Tas uh, Gancharov, uh, Nikolai. Uh, Dr. De uh, Zerba, uh, you spoke about uh, the development of this network of international monitoring um, uh, system facilities. Uh, how many uh, facilities uh, are already in place in uh, Russia and what is uh, their future? Any plans for uh, setting up additional uh, facilities? How many of them and what's the time um, period for them? Thank you very much. Thank you. The, the setup of the International Monitoring System facility in Russia, I think we have uh, uh, about 32 stations that are meant to be established in uh, Russia. Among the 32 stations that have to be established, 25 for the, of them are already in place. This is over 75% of the stations in Russia that are already in place and then working. So we have to work towards getting the remaining one, and this is the reason of our visit today to see what are the hurdles and then how we can push forward with completing the, the international monitoring system facilities in Russia because it is important. And Russia's commitment is uh, no mystery to anyone that their commitment will lead us well underway towards the completion of those international monitoring system facilities. Uh, a question of clarification, if you permit. So uh, I uh, got it right that 32 are planned to be in Russia and 25 are operating already. Then how many stations of this type are in the world? And what is the time uh, period for them to, c uh, to be completed, to be put into operation? And what kind of uh, facilities are we speaking about? Because in the leaflets that we were um, given, uh, several types of these facilities are mentioned. What, uh, what particular facilities do we have in Russia? Uh, thank you. Uh, excellent question. Indeed, I was talking about uh, the facilities in Russia, but the facilities in Russia are part of the overall international monitoring system. Uh, which is a network of over 330 stations around the globe to be established. But among them, we have nearly 280 that are functioning and that have been built and then in operation. This is close, we're getting close, we about 85% complete worldwide in terms of the International Monitoring System Network. We're working with the remaining countries where the establishment of the facilities are yet to be built. And then we are still constructing the station, and then we're hoping that in the next couple of years uh, we should be well underway and getting close to uh, the 300, the over 330 station and laboratory that need to be put in place. But it's a network of globally over 330, 
with four technologies. The technology are seismic, infrasound, hydroacoustic, and radionuclide. In Russia, you have the three uh, uh, stations, the three technologies, which is seismic, infrasound, and radionuclide station that are covering the Russian territory. And the uh, hydroacoustic station, we find them in uh, other islands. We have 11 of them because, as you know, the hydroacoustic station have to be its underwater station that we built with uh, an offshore, co I mean, a shore component. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there more questions to, to our guest? Looks like uh, I will be the last to ask the question. You mentioned uh, that uh, the international monitoring system may uh, serve uh, civic uh, purposes. Are there uh, specific examples when uh, the uh, IMS uh, uh, contributed to the minimization of uh, natural disasters like tsunami or earthquakes? Thank you. Uh, indeed, I mentioned the civil and scientific application of our technologies. Uh, we are uh, serving under the umbrella of UNESCO IOC, uh, the in, uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Center in Paris, uh, to establish international tsunami organization and providing data to them in a way where it's understood that our data are the most reliable, uh, probably the quickest and then the most efficient through our global communication infrastructure to reach timely the International Tsunami Center for them to be able to give the warning to the population should a tsunami happen. That's one of the contributions that we're doing. If you take, for instance, what has happened in Fukushima, in Fukushima, uh, this uh, disastrous accident, uh, we've tested all the four technologies of our international monitoring system. We had the seismic uh, network that detected the earthquake, the hydroacoustic component that linked to the seismic with regard to the tsunami itself, the infrasound that detected the explosion of the nuclear power plant, and then the radionuclide station that helped cover globally the dispersion of the radionuclide isotope around the world. And those information were made available to all our member states and then made available to institutions that are working in radiation protection for their use, including the International Atomic Energy Agency. Well, I know that um, our guest has very tight schedule and he is in a hurry for his next meeting. Uh, we wish you well and a very fruitful stay in Moscow. Thank you very much and we welcome you and next time in our uh, platform. Thank you. Thank you very much.